it's not like one of those green hornets that you blow your harmonica into. Uh, no, do you want one of those? <laughs> sure. I have to buy one. Oh no, it's you only use that if you're going to sing through your guitar amp. <laughs> <laughs> And and all the good artists sing through their guitar amp. It happens. Do they really? Mm-hmm. Who sings through their guitar amp? Harmonica players. Hey everybody, welcome to the Pre Accident Podcast. I am Todd Conklin, and this is the podcast that you're a part of pretty much every week. Thanks for listening. I can't even t- <clears throat> thank you so much for listening. It amazes me. It really it almost freaks me out a little. I mean, just a tiny bit. Not a whole. It's not a total freak out. Don't get me wrong. I still got clothes on and stuff. But but um, the numbers are just uh, a lot of people listen, and um, I'm uh, just pleased as punch. I couldn't be happier. I mean, it kind of makes doing it worthwhile, and that's a pretty important part of what happens. I think. I don't know what you think. So today's gonna be a really fun day. Because due to circumstances beyond my abilities and controls, uh, I've become really fixated again on this notion of how we look at and measure what we do. And it's a long story. I mean, there's, there, there's a lot of stories around it, but I got in a kind of a big little heated debate with a, uh, <clears throat> another person who pretty much told me that uh, the work we do is contingent really around the number of people we injure. And that, in fact, we've got to push ourselves harder to develop leading predictive metrics. And I don't know what, so I'm no genius. I never promised, I never even act like a genius. But I've, I've really struggled my whole entire career. I mean, I can remember having this argument 20 years ago. I don't know of any predictive leading data that is meaningful in a way we want it to be. I, it, it's really hard to predict uncertainty. And so I thought, you know, maybe I should tackle this with young Ned Harris because Ned is a metrics guy. He's not a safety guy, which actually makes this better. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a metrics person. He's a measurement. That's what he did for his whole career. And, and you've heard him before. He's been on the podcast before. So I invited him back over. And we had some burritos at a place called El Parasol, which if you've not been there, put it on your list. It's that good. I had the red chili chicken burrito and the guacamole taco. Yes, it was quite delicious. Anyway, we sat down after lunch, and we were sort of shooting the breeze. And he started talking to me about a project he's working on. And he was talking about how we we viewed data as if it's the finite ending point and how data is really the beginning of an intervention into an organization. And so now I'm interested. I'm totally in with both feet. So I, I immediately said, can, do you mind not having this conversation? And let's, let's put this on the podcast. Cause I just went through this big argument that's kind of fresh on my brain. I mean, I have that argument all the time so that, that it's not emotional and everybody were friends and it ended fine. But I mean, That desperate need to hold on to the belief that there's just some metric out there we haven't tapped yet, man, that's that's frightening to me because if it were out there, I think big, rich companies would have paid for it. A lot of pay. um, They'd have paid a lot of money for it. They would have paid dearly for it. It just doesn't exist. So so Ned and I sat around and started talking, and that's the conversation we're going to have for today's podcast. I think you're going to like it a lot. Um, Anyway, I think it's good. I, I think it's... Well, I'll just say this. Um, It's changed the way I think about leading metrics. And now I wonder if I'm wrong. I actually think there are metrics that can help us lead the organization as an organizational intervention into a direction that's better. And if that's what leading metrics mean, I'm all about it. But but I'll, I'll, I'll sort of, I'll delay my comments until you hear the conversation, and then you tell me what you think. I'd be really curious to what you think. This is probably a podcast you'll want to pass around a little bit, too. So I won't uh, belabor it with a bunch of goofy stuff like normal. I'll kind of cut to the chase so that if your boss is listening to it or your boss's boss is listening to it, um, it'll maybe get right to the point pretty quickly. So without any further ado, here's a conversation between um, myself 
and young Ned Harris. And uh, Ned and I go way back. Um, if you don't know, listen to the last podcast. There's kind of a better introduction of him. I think you'll find this interesting. Listen carefully and tell me what you think. So we meet again, my friend. Hey, Dodd. And we're never going to stop meeting because I'm convinced the metric question will never be answered. Am I wrong? Mm, well, there are measurements that say it'll never be end. Yeah. Really? Who has those measurements? <laughs> and are they predictive? What is it? 67% of all statistics are made up on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> What's your gut feeling on predictive metrics? Well, I, you and I touched on this a little bit last time we spoke. And there's a whole world called predictive analytics, which is doing huge, huge data sets and making calculations that typically have almost no risk or very limited risk. And so that's, that's one thing we can't just dismiss out of hand, but it's, it's, I don't want to dwell there. I think it's more interesting to think about, um, you know, so a safety metric, for instance, can you start to predict fatalities by, you know, sprains? Do two sprained wrists equal a fatality or do they portend a fatality? And I would say they don't. Um, and so I think that it's worth looking at preconditions that are necessary to avoid things that you don't want to happen. And so, you know, we all put on our seatbelts. We see that as a precondition to safe driving or at least lower consequence of a mistake. Fair enough. I mean, and that, so now you know two things, if I can interrupt you long enough to interrupt you. One is the notion that you, you just pretty much blew Heinrich's pyramid um, out of the water by saying two sprained ankles don't equate a fatality or even 30 sprained ankles don't equate a fatality. That is a really heavy burden because we spent a lot of time telling organizations to pay attention to the small events in order to predict the big catastrophic failures. And that's just fundamentally wrong. I agree. Um, I think there's a place, though, where if you're working in a place where you have 30 sprained ankles, you do not have all the preconditions necessary to have a safe workplace. You're demonstrating it with every sprained ankle. And so... Or you have a perfect environment for spraining ankles. Ah, ice skating. Um, <laughs> I was thinking rollerblades, but I think we're in the same place. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're working on the same thing. Um, but I, th so I think that you can look at sprained ankle data and say, oh, there's something deficient about the safety of this in terms of building um, a safe environment. Clearly, we're not succeeding. Um, but I don't think you get to predict anything further than that. Um, and I think that if you're in a world where you start reducing sprained ankles, you similarly should not be too comfortable that you're produce, they're reducing the risk of fatalities either. Um, and so if we're out rollerblading, as we would be, getting our 30 sprained ankles, um, if we suddenly stopped getting sprained ankles, it doesn't mean we're any less likely to get hit by a car. It doesn't mean we're any less likely to go off a railing. It doesn't mean... And so... I think that we have to be a little bit careful about associating one metric sprained ankles with another metric, which would be, you know, workplace fatalities. And it takes a lot of discipline to see them separately because they're both really important and they may have some root causes in common, but I wouldn't necessarily rest easier because I've got, um, you know, fewer sprained ankles that doesn't translate to me. It's so interesting, right? I mean, that was maybe the best discussion around Heinrich or non-Heinrich, anti-Heinrich thinking that I've heard in a long, long time. Well, it took us, you know, it took us a while to get around it. It was the Heinrich maneuver. But yeah. <laughs> I'm choking. Give me the Heinrich maneuver. That's perfect. I love it, right? But I cut you off around this notion of conditions. So talk to me about these conditions and how metrics really sort of function there. So I, you know, let's just keep this as simple as possible, but something like maintenance, I would say that, you know, equipment maintenance is a precondition for safety. And clearly it's not the only one it's, but it's one that you can't just dismiss out of hand. And so if you're paying attention to equipment maintenance, that you can do a couple of things with that. If you're a plant manager and you're looking at equipment maintenance, then you can say, okay, that is one precondition for safe work. And that's great. And that's if your audience is the plant manager. 
But if you also go back to your workers and you start sharing with them the fact, hey, look, we're maintaining equipment on this cycle and we're maintaining that cycle or we're meeting that cycle um, this percentage of the time and we have a goal to improve that cycle, you're, that now is a metric having to do with maintenance of equipment. But its real use is that you are in a position where you're communicating with your line workers that they are – that having maintained equipment is important to you, that that's something that they're you, – you realize that's a precondition to their safety, and you want them to know that. And you want them to be able to recognize that not only as a value but also as a precondition to work. So let's back up a minute because <clears throat> you said something in there that I'm not even sure – um, you thought was important, but I think maybe is kind of earth shattering. And that is metrics have different effects depending on who actually is the target of the metrics. So yeah. Is target the right word? And no, you know, this is, this is a, who's, this who's is a funny place. Use, user the, of the metric user. The, I think the easy word here is stakeholder. Hey, I know, but I don't know another one, you know, audience, is pretty bad. Yeah, audience uh, is wrong. It's it's yeah, that's wrong. Intended is sort of sounds like how about betrothed? Betrothed is that's better <laughs> than intended. Um, but there is there is a there there metrics are almost always you know built for someone's consumption and whoever that person is or whatever that class of people are um, is super important. But you're saying it's different. So metrics. The same metric read by a manager has a different effect on the manager than that same metric who's read by a worker would have a different effect on the worker. Yeah, absolutely. So do we think that way? I mean, do we, when we, when we craft metrics, do we craft metrics around who they're, who the intent, who the betrothed is, who the intended people or, or how that intended person, personage, those intended people will be impacted by them? I, I, yeah, maybe. And I don't know. I think no. Well, I would I'd like to give everyone the benefit of the doubt on okay. this one. You're the, a nice the, person. Thank you. The problem is, is that the way the metrics are shared is very different. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was Edgar Schein that basically said the way to roll out a metric, if you were going to do a, a, a climate survey of the working environment, you would collect all of your data, you do your analysis, and then you'd show it initially to the people that gave you the data. Then you'd show it to the team leaders and you'd show it to group leaders and it would roll up until sometime after everyone else had had a chance to look at it and kind of metabolize it, would it go to a CXO of some sort? And is that, is that Shine? Yeah, that's definitely in, in that's in Shine's bailiwick for sure. Yeah. And so similarly doing, um, you know, survey data, I think the first audience for survey data should be the people that gave you the data. You know, if you ask me, Hey, how did we do today? I, you know, it's really rewarding to know how my response fits in with everyone else's and you can't tell me before cause then it'll change the way I respond. And, uh, but, and then at that, at some point, a data, something that's very summative, something that sort of is a snapshot of something that's happened in the past as metrics are typically, um, that sort of a snapshot given to a senior manager is going to be just a snapshot of what happened in time. And it's going to be, you know, a description of what occurred right then, what the, what the situation was. Whereas if you show that to someone who's much closer to the work, someone who's doing the work, they may be able to use that very same data to do something formative with it. They may be able to, you know, improve something. They may be able to make that move from proving, which is sort of the summative data, it's like your financial statements, to improving, which would have to do with changing your product line or changing your billing cycle or changing whatever it would be to go from sort of this cross-sectional photograph of what is to a uh, more of a state of how things can be improved. And so I think, what did we settle on? Betrothed? I think, <laughs> I think depending on who you're betrothed in, this, in that simple example changes entirely whether or not this is a summation of what happened or whether it becomes something productive for what could be. And I think the people who have a really good shot at solving problems are people who are close to the work. And I don't want to make that sound like a truism, but it's probably pretty close to it. I think so. I mean, I think, I think the, the world's experts in how work is done 
are the people who actually do the work. Okay. Right. Right. It's it's sort of classic Taylorism the the idea that you can somehow separate thinking from doing. Yeah. Which is kind of goofy. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, not it, a, Taylorism. Not a big Taylor fan. It didn't really hold too well. Not a big management science. Um. So okay. So let's accept your anti-Taylor premise that the people who are closest to the work are people who know most about how it's getting done. Then at some level, it would make sense to give them the best crack at the data and to let them see what they are doing and what effect it's having and what spillover effects it's having and where else within the organization um, this, this, you know, their impact is felt. And what would that data product look like? Um, it could look very much like the data product that's going up to the CXO. It could be probably it'd be a little more localized. I imagine you'd roll things up by the time you got to the C-suite, but um, it could be the same reports. And I'm not exactly recommending that everyone just go out and throw this on their intranet and let everyone see it. I'm actually be more interested in having, if it's, if there's value to it, having it shared and discussed at, you know, a pre-brief or at a, uh, you know, whatever the pre-meetings are for work, where you could start saying, hey, look, this is what our waste looked like. This is what our time cycle looked like. This is what our defective materials coming in looked like. This is what, and let the people who are closest to the work, who are the experts, have really an access to the most useful data. I think this also accomplishes something else that you and I spoke about a little bit, which has to do with when metrics become rote, when they become symbolic, when they become ritualized. And if I know that if every day I had to go out and count something and send an email to somebody and that was the end of that task, that that would become symbolic and ritualized very quickly. It would not, I wouldn't see a whole lot of value in it, except it was sort of a term of my employment. Whereas if that same information got fed back to me in a form that really made sense to me, then all of a sudden I actually might be more interested in helping produce this metric. I might be more interested in counting whatever it is. And I might be more invested in having a good data set, a longevity, um, in, you know, whatever the, whatever, the, whatever the object is. Well, so let me give you an example. Um, uh, maybe a mini itsy bitsy case study. So uh, yesterday I was on a plane and a, a friend of mine I hadn't seen in probably 35 years stepped up next to me. We were on a Southwest flight and, uh, and we, we reacquainted. It was so fun to see him. And I said, let's sit together on the plane. And he said, okay, no one ever wants to sit by me anyway. So it was kind of nice. Right. And, uh, he proceeded to tell me that he was the chief of radiation oncology for the VA. So he's done pretty well. I mean, it's a mm. kind of a cool job. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's an important job. I don't know. Cool is the right word. And he asked me what I did and I made some crap up and told him what I did. And he started talking about the good catch program that the VA has and that they're on the hook. The doctors are on the hook to report a certain amount of good catches every week. And if they don't report those good catches every week, they actually get dinged for it. So that becomes, in your words, sort of rote compliance data, right? <laughs> Ritualized data, I believe is the word you used, right? Yeah. And so that's not very meaningful. That's definitely lagging. And the the data really serves to keep you from getting into trouble. Fair enough? Well, it's not data at that point because I think a lot of it at that point you're going to be recycling and a lot of yeah. or you're going to be making things up or you're knife going to in the sink. Redefine what good means, you're going to redefine what catch means. And so that sort of compulsory thing, um, that you know, without knowing any details on the face of it, I suspect that turns in pretty suspect data. Well, which, which I think started with good intention, right? I mean, the intent is fine. Sure. And I'm sure when it was first rolled out, there was a whole communication plan so we all could learn best practices from right. each other. Sure, sure, sure. And that there was, and I bet all that stuff fell by the, or if it hasn't fallen by the wayside, without someone injecting a lot of energy into it, it will fall by the wayside. So let me get to the payoff of this question then. What should that program look like, Mr. Metrics Man? In terms of rewarding good behavior within good, good catches good catches so, so i i think those are condition i mean i wouldn't say good catches are behavioral i mean i think some people that listen to podcasts might think they are but i think they're identifying conditions that are potentially brittle or fragile but what i'm interested in is how do i use less of a summative form of data 
and a, and a, and a different way to gather that information so it's more meaningful? Well, I would start with how it's reported. And so if you have a time when radiation oncologists from around the VA get together and have a meeting, say, and, the, you know, an annual meeting or something, that each site could be asked to talk about the, their best practices and the changes that they did over the course of that year to derive those best practices. And so at some point, if you're talking about a best practice or the changes that happen somewhere in that spectrum, I'm going to recognize myself and where I am on that continuum, whether I'm at the beginning of doing it, the beginning, you know, the way you started out or whether I'm beyond you in terms of doing the best practice. Um, and I think that is a place where the goal is to learn. The goal is to share and teach. And so the act of counting is not helping anyone really learn or share or teach. Whereas the act of, you know, describing the steps that took to go and improve your practice. Now that, that to me seems like it would be useful. How do I measure that though? Well, not all measurements are in numbers. And so there's, you know, this is back to the sort of the quantitative thing, but the qualitative data, much harder to work with, much easier to bias, much easier, you know, really messy. And we kind of step away from it. But if you're at the VA, you may well actually have some sort of patient data to support that when you went from, you know, X-ray X to X-ray Y, you had a lower incident of burning, say, which is a problem for radiation oncologists. So you might be able to back into some data that way. But I think that it's not everything can be measured. Not everything that matters can be measured. Not everything that can be measured matters. I think that's somebody's quote. Um, Someone famous. Somebody famous. Somebody with crazy hair, as I recall. I know. Great. And rides a bicycle. <laughs> yeah. Worked in a patent office. Anyway, I can't remember who he is. But there's this, it, it, not all of our education, you know, so the goal is to improve, right? The goal is to teach. The goal is to learn from other sites. And if that's the case, it may not reside in numeric data. And yet your, your stakeholder question becomes really profound here because if the stakeholder is the improvement owners, so patient safety experts or, or hospital reliability experts, then the presence of the good catch is where the metrics meaningful. It doesn't really matter the quality of the good catch or, or what we learned or how we improved. It's the presence of the good catch. Well, so but what happens the, if your stakeholder is the patient? Well, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> for the doctor, it's really much different because their learning needs to be improvement, new ideas or identification of conditions that are significant. If you're the patient, I would think you'd have a completely other value set that you'd place on this and and you'd want to know that they're finding problems early and they're finding them when they're easy to correct and and identifiable. It, I think this is really interesting. Did you you remember the checklist manifesto? That I, was a huge improvement in healthcare and I'm sorry I'm not prepared to you know I don't have notes or anything. You're not going to quote from I'm a, not going to quote I'm not even going to be able to tell you who wrote the checklist manifesto. Do, do you want me to tell you? Yeah. Atal Gawande. Ah, Thank Atal you. Gawande. Thank you. I'm here for you. Thank you. This is nice. It's like, uh, hey, Google. Um, so so Gawande's thing is that the checklist all by itself didn't really do all that much. It was when the nurses and the uh, support people were empowered to tell the doctors, hey, you didn't just you didn't wash your hands. Hey, you didn't just you know, you didn't you know, you didn't use gloves. You didn't whatever the whatever the the catch was there. It wasn't the fact that there was a checklist. It was a fact that there were people around who were empowered to so, sort of support the findings of the checklist. So can metrics create psychological safety? Uh, psychological safety is a good thing or a bad thing? Good good thing. A oh, good thing. So oh, yeah. th that's the point you're making with the checklist is that it created an environment where it was okay to speak truth to power. It's, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a psychologically safe place to speak of. Yes. And yes, oh. metrics absolutely can, you know, they're, no matter what a metric is, it's a communicative act and it can be a communicative act that falls on a deaf ear or it can be a communicative act, which, you know, sp causes, you know, great or terrible things to happen. But if no one can act on the metric or if no one chooses to act on the metric or if the metric even say has no use or no value, 
then it's no longer really much of a communicative act. And so allowing people to have uh, information, it's no longer data. It's been transformed into infor having information that can then be used to support programs or decisions or empowerment or psychological safety is all, you know, that's, that's a really high use of a metric. That's great. And, and it's formative. And it's formative. Yes, I, it changes so, things. So now this is a metric that's changing the way people think about what it is they're doing. By virtue of the fact that it, the audience for that metric has changed. So that exploding sound you're hearing earlier was my mind. Because I'd never put together the fact that, I mean, it makes so much sense. I'm such an idiot that a metric is a communicative act. It's a, it's, it's a way we sort of communicate, which in fact then has the ability to influence, right? Intervene, if you will, in how an organization functions. Well, if that's true, Ned, and I, I think it certainly sounds true, then the way we're using metrics now is probably fundamentally wrong. Maybe there's a, I mean, there's a real use for summative metrics. And so, you know, just think of compliance as a, as a box. And that's a really important box. I mean, there's an awful lot of stuff that has to go into compliance. There's an awful lot of stuff that we do for the sake of say OSHA. And I think those metrics are no longer necessarily communicative acts. Many of them are rote, Many of them are sort of symbolic. Some of them become very ritualized and they still have a huge amount of value. You can't just say, oh, this whole thing with OSHA is not, doesn't have any value because of course it does. I mean, we need to, we need to demonstrate compliance. We need to keep our insurance companies happy. We need, there's a, a metrics end of doing a lot of sort of lifting for an organization like that, but that's all strictly summative stuff. And if some of that information were fed back to employees, they would be back, they would be in a position where they could say, Oh, we can improve that. We can, we can, we, I know why that number is what it is and we can, you know, we can, we can work on that. And so it depends very much who your audience is. I'm not willing to throw out all summative metrics. Again, I think they're hugely valuable. Um, but I also recognize that a lot of these summative metrics aren't good for, say, process improvement, or they're not good for, um, you know, organizational excellence. They're they're good for documenting a stable state, which is probably about where you want it in terms of compliance. But if you're really looking for development opportunities, it probably is going to be residing in different people looking at the same data or maybe, you know, tailored data sets. So when we would go to meetings at Los Alamos, sit in the lab and go to meetings and they'd start the meeting with the TRC and DART rate, I always kind of felt their message was you should go back and change history. Y That's yeah. not the right use of that metric. And it's not a helpful metric. If they would have started a metric with an area that had potential for growth, then maybe I would have sit there as a worker, as an employee and thought, oh, that's an area I can pay attention to after this meeting. Yeah. And so you're into this whole concept of dependent versus independent variables. And so the DART TRC are these dependent variables and they're dependent upon gazillion things, right? They're dependent upon how people wake up and how much coffee they drink and whether they're following procedures and whether they're making good decisions and whether, you know, it's, it's dependent upon a zillion things, your processes, by and large. And so to give someone a summary metric of a, um, you know, a DART or a TRC is it's ultimately it's not that helpful because they, we don't have any control over that summary metric. We have control over components to that and not even, we don't always have control over components, but if we have any control at all, we have components over the independent variables. And the so, conditions, the, the conditions, the conditions you were talking about. And earlier. so, you know, stepping on a scale every morning is not going to help you lose weight. Whereas, um, you know, not no longer eating, you know, f food or something might. But if you all you do is step on the scale. <laughs> yes, it might. It might. Well, I was I, see. I was going to say no longer walking by the break room where the donuts are. Oh, those That's donuts are going. long gone, dude. OK, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think, but I, I think it's worth pausing for a moment. I'm not doing a great job here, but I think it's worth pausing and thinking about what are dependent variables, what are independent variables, and what do we have effect on? And so you and I can act somewhat deliberately 
on independent variables. We can, we can change things. We can change. We can always take the elevator instead of the stairs. We can always wipe off the telephone after we use it. We can always, you know, there are things, there, there are little things that we can do that might increase safety or reduce illness or something in a workplace. Whereas if all you're given is a DART or a TRC, it's hard to either recognize yourself in it. You certainly don't want to recognize yourself in it. And well, if you didn't get hurt, you're not in it. Right. And so, you know, if that line is going to keep going down, that means you can't report any injuries. That means you can't, you know, it, it's, there's, it's, whereas if you one week looked at, okay, this is what happened. We started asking everyone to wear a hard hat on this date and here's our dart here. See, Hey, and we started asking everyone to wear eye protection on this date. Oh, and here's our DART TRC. Hey, we gave everyone back braces on this date. And here's our. And so if you can start tying it to variables over which we have some control, then all of a sudden, yeah, you know, the DART or TRC is this big roll up of a whole bunch of stuff. But if you can help people tease all those components apart and recognize where they fit, you know, teaching a bunch of office workers to wear a hard hat isn't going to get you a whole lot. Whereas, you know, teaching a whole bunch of people who are on a shop floor how to, you know, avoid carpal tunnel while typing probably isn't going to get you a whole lot. But they both show up on that dark TRC. And so, well, maybe not the hard hat in the office. But um, <laughs> but we have to, you know, it's some of these, you know, variables or some of these metrics that end up being big summaries are useful maybe at the C-suite or maybe to an investor or maybe somebody somewhere. But if you're trying to improve a process, you wouldn't start with Dart TRC. You'd start with the process. I mean, this is this is so interesting because I think about this all the time. And today I thought about stuff I never thought about. Huh. I feel like my I feel like we're sort of meandering around a little bit and we still haven't solved the whole issue of what do you call the stakeholder, the betrothed, the beloved. Why don't we the, send that out and see what they say? Yeah. Because there it, has to be a better word than stakeholder, for God's sakes. Because I've got a whole book full of synonyms. It's like Roger's like synonym book or something uh-huh. like that. And there's really nothing for stakeholder in there. It's, well, too, it's too jargony. Even it's for- very jargony. It's a term of art. It's been kind of, it's a little bit on the bingo card of office language. Um, so let's maybe, let's maybe see if there's a better word. Yeah. Thanks, man. I can't even thank you enough. That's an incredibly fun way to spend a half hour. Todd, it's always fun to be with you. And there you have it. What do you think? Metrics as an intervention? Who would have known? Metrics as a product, metrics as an analysis, metric as an endpoint, got it all day long, but as an intervention? Ned, my brother, you're blowing my brain out. That's it. That's the podcast for today. I'm way over time. I owe you three minutes. Listen carefully. Keep listening. Subscribe. Tell your friends. You're all welcome. I'm glad you're here. It's fun to have you hanging out with me. Until then, learn something new every single day. I bet you did today. Have as much fun as you possibly can, and for goodness sakes, be safe. It's not like one of those green hornets that you blow your harmonica into, though. No, do you want one of those? <laughs> sure. I'll have to buy one. Oh, no. it's You only use that if you're going to sing through your guitar amp. <laughs> <laughs> And and all the good artists sing through their guitar amp. It happens. Do they really? Mm-hmm. Who sings through their guitar amp? Harmonica players. <laughs>